So um, I'm, I'm a retired military officer. I served 26 years in the Air Force. And, uh, you know, even in my retirement, I, may, I remain really interested in what's going on in the Department of Defense. I have friends that are still serving, not too many because I'm pretty long in the tooth, but um, I do have sons and, and, and just people I know through a long, you know, time of, of being around the military. And so I get a couple of newsletters, and these newsletters just pop into my inbox from time to time. Most of the time, I just click and they go away, and I don't really read them. But one hit me pretty recently, and it was uh, entitled, Air Force Demotes Former General as IG Report Reveals Details of an Illicit Affair. And so, you know, my heart sank when I, I read the headline, and then I opened it up, and I read through it, and... Um, it just, it just is sad because I've seen this more often than I would like over the years. It's always disturbing when a leader falls, when a high-ranking leader falls, when someone who's supposed to be an example to others falls, and it always leaves a very wide path of, of devastation. As I looked deep, deeper into this particular case, I, I noticed that uh, it, it hit closer to home based on what I did in the military. This guy was a fighter pilot. Um, he was a two-star general. He had one of the top jobs in the Air Force, and he was on his way to four stars, probably, and, and high, high influence. And so um, what's shocking about this is, you know, this guy was gifted. He was gifted as a leader. He was gifted as a thinker. He was gifted as a pilot. He had combat experience, a resume that kind of reads like, you know, fiction almost, he had commanded squadrons and wings. He'd served at the Pentagon in high-level positions, and uh, he'd, he'd gotten the promotions and opportunities that are, are the kind of right for a person that's really on their way. And so you have to ask, what happened? What happened? Well, without going into any explicit details, he, this man, this, this Air Force leader, succumbed to a sexual temptation and began an affair, an illicit affair, with a subordinate female. And when things were found out, as they always are, <clears throat> they always are, it was found out. He lost his job, his reputation, his marriage, his future. But the damage was not isolated to him alone. Believe me, it, it just, it, it's always true that there's second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, almost unimaginable numbers of effects as they, they kind of go outward. It's, it's really incalculable. It's like a destructive detonation that just blows, and then there's ever-widening concentric circles of damage, and I think this is very true, as we'll see as we go into the text. Numbers 32, 23 warns all who would heed, be sure your sin will find you out. Well, our scripture today tells about a great king, King David, who fell to sexual temptation thousands of years ago, and let's just look at that inspired text now. Let me read it, 2 Samuel 11, verses 1 to 5. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. Well, here we see the, the beginnings of one of the most tragic stories in all of Scripture, and there are a lot of tragic stories in Scripture, we know, because we're sinners. Um, this one in particular is King David's fall into adultery with another man's wife. And the adultery, of course, did result in a scandalous pregnancy and then an attempted cover-up, and uh, then the cover-up failed, and then that eventually led to murder. There's a chain of events here that just is breathtaking, and it resulted in extreme and far-reaching negative consequences for David and for all of Israel as well. He was their king. Widespread damage 
not confined to the temporal even. David brought grief to his God in a manner we can only wonder about. The very last words of chapter 11 summarize with this, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Ponder that for a second. Just just let that sink in. The good and holy and all-powerful sovereign of the universe, David's God, who brought victory to him, um, he was grieved by what David had done and uh, impacted by David's disobedient choices. So there's many, many profound lessons to learn from the whole saga. We're just covering verses 1 to 5 this morning. But we need to ask, why was David not at the front? Why was he not out where he was supposed to be, leading Israel as her king and general? And then we need to ask, why is God's anointed king, literally man after God's own heart, as David had described in 1 Samuel 13, 14, why did he just blow right past all these clear boundaries and layers of accountability uh, and let his desire take over to taste of what was not his? We just, you know, in our vernacular today, we just want to go, what was he thinking? What was he thinking? But maybe, maybe the better question is this, what was in David's heart that led him down this path of destruction? And more importantly, is that same malevolent propensity residing within your heart, within my heart? And as Christians, we know it's true. We have a sin nature. Galatians talks about spirit and flesh battling, and we have the power of the spirit to help us make right choices. But we know that this propensity is big, and it can lead us to destroy ourselves and others. And uh, we need to understand it. We need to respond rightly as Christians. Christians. There was... uh, a guy by the name of Alan Carr who popped up in my research on this, and he, he did a great job framing this story, of this tragedy of David and Bathsheba in this way. This, this is such a, it's, it's so heavy with the question, why? But he said it this way, when you think of the life of David, one of two events probably come to mind. You either remember the time young David slew Goliath, or you remember when David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Both events were monumental in the lives of David. In the first, David revealed his humility. In the second, David revealed the fact of his humanity. In the first, David proved that he was a man of faith. In the second, David proved that he was a man of flesh. When David met a giant named Goliath, we are privileged to witness his greatest victory. When David met Bathsheba, we are forced to watch his greatest victory defeat. Up until this moment, David had never lost a battle, at least in terms of his generalship. Every time he stepped onto the field of combat, he won the battle and walked off off the field the victor, and this was because God was ever with him. God was with him, and these were God's victories. But in the text today, we see that David willingly entered into a scenario absent God's blessing and protection, and unfortunately, the ground there turned out to be high stakes arena of combat, and he came up against an overpowering enemy that defeated him. He was, he was defeated that day, and then we'll see the consequences. So he, he faced another kind of giant, you might say, not a flesh and blood giant like Goliath, but a giant that I'm going to argue he had welcomed and nourished into his heart over a long period of time. This wasn't just a one-off for David. And I want you to see that as the text brings it out. And what turned out to be um, a giant of lust that was just more powerful than probably Goliath could ever have been. So, again, quoting Pastor Carr, I'm gonna say this is about a giant that slew David, a giant of his own making. It defeated him and brought negative consequences. So, as we try to look at this, and look at our own hearts, I want to show you there are four clear warnings, four clear warnings for every believer that come out of this text, and you need to heed these warnings in your own Christian walk, so hopefully you can avoid a path of destruction like this. To get to these warnings, we're going to look at four categories of David's choices, so David's dereliction, his desire, David's decisions, and finally his dilemma, so under those Ds, there will come out a warning, so... Follow along if you're taking notes. So let's begin with the first one, David's dereliction. His dereliction, first one, 
In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. This verse is telling us that King David, General David, anointed by God David, hero of Israel David, protector of Israel David, man after God's own heart, David was guilty of dereliction of duty. He was supposed to be out at the front. He was supposed to be leading his troops in battle. This means a lot to me as a former military officer. You go where you're sent and you do your duty. And David was not setting a good example, certainly, but he was supposed to be fighting the Ammonites. That was his calling, his mission, his responsibility before God. This is what God expected from him. It's what Israel expected from him. And so who are these Ammonites that he was supposed to go fight? It's important to look at them. So they're descendants of Ben-Ami, who was the son of Lot, Abraham's nephew, and Lot's younger daughter. So there's iniquity in that whole lash up and how these people came to be, Genesis 1938, the capital of this uh, Iron Age kingdom of Ammon was Rabbah, which is now modern day Amman, Jordan. But these Ammonites, these Ammonites, they were sworn enemies of God. They worshiped a different God and they wanted to do away with Yahweh and do away with the Jewish nation. And so they, uh, they wanted to take over, they wanted to supplant Israel and supplant Yahweh. So David's choice to stay home wasn't just some, I've done my duty, I've got my medals, I've got my shadow box, I, what else is there for me to do? I'll send somebody else. No, it was, it was a profound betrayal. He was not in some rest and relaxation mode like it's good to do time to time. He was disobeying his commander, God Almighty. And so David sending Joab out to do his job was a failure at best and a terrible betrayal at worst. Why? You have to ask why. Why did he do it? Well, David got prideful. David knew that God was with him. We can read that in 2 Samuel 5, 12. And David knew that the Lord had established him king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. And David, David had just a string of successes, and he may have forgotten the truth that God will only walk with those who are going his way. The prophet Amos, in Amos 3.3, 3 says, do two walk together unless they have agreed to meet? The wisdom here is that God's protection and provision demand harmony with his purposes. And you can see that in Scripture all the way through. When we're out of sync with God's purpose and plan, we're going a bad direction. Quickly, things start to fall apart. Moreover, we should never, ever take personal credit for what God is doing through us. David's victories were God's victories because God alone is the hero of every story in the Bible. God is always the hero. Every story, every truth points back to the glory of God. That's why we're here is to bring glory to God. And then he uses us and it's awesome to be a part of what he's doing and his goodness. So one writer said it this way, you see when people are passing through hard times, they become very dependent upon the Lord. There's no room for pride when you are depending on the Lord for everything you need. However, when successes come, when one's dreams are fulfilled, when you have what you have worked for for so long and what you've desired for so long, it's pretty easy to become lifted up in pride. That's a great way to say it. And pride can give way to arrogance. And David had enjoyed absolute success and victory. And so this success was a heady thing. You know, but hear this. A person is never more vulnerable than when they have enjoyed great success and adulation that comes with that success. We see that all the time in our culture. People who are really high and then the fall is long. People tend to develop a feeling that they're invincible and they're not. And so David, probably believing his own press, he forgot what Proverbs, the the just the fundamental truth in Proverbs 16.8, who would, it would be penned later by his son. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. So we, we, we need people in our lives. We need uh, fail-safes. We need to be checked. We need trusted people who will speak the truth and love to us and keep us humble. So I think about the guy I opened with, that Air Force officer, that two-star general. Were there people around him who 
saw a train wreck developing? Yeah, I'm sure there were. Um, it's not hard to see when somebody's going down this kind of path, but, you know, did anybody step in? Maybe somebody tried. I don't, I don't know. But even as people around a leader watch it all kind of unfold in slow motion, you have to go back to this was a sin in David's heart. The, the guilt was his, and he was neglecting his spiritual health. People who stay close to the Lord through prayer and reading and meditating upon his word and who are accountable and who are in church and in fellowship groups and we're just transparent with one another because we're just all in the same boat. There you find safety. And David's dereliction of duty put him in precisely the wrong place at precisely the wrong time. So here's warning number one. Warning number one, rooted in the idea of dereliction, stay humble before the Lord and in your humility, do your duty. Do your duty. Do your duty and don't make it about you lest you put yourself in a risky situation. All right, let's turn now to uh, David's desire, his desire, his lust. Look at verse 2. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, and he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. One commentator kind of said it this way, David was in bed when he should have been in battle, and upon that foundational problem, we just see this. This desire awakened, and then something unholy is triggered in him, and it's almost inexorable, the momentum that's going to build, and he's just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and lo and behold, there's the temptation, and things get set in motion. It happened. It happened. The English translation here is uh, original Hebrew, hayah is the verb, it's straightforward, it means to happen or to occur, to come to pass. It's very accurate, it's one-to-one, there's no ambiguity here. I just think it's interesting because in light of all that happens, it happened, it's just so succinct and it just comes with a strong punch and it just draws you right in. It did me as I was reading this, it happened. There's just an ominous feel to it and, and for good reason because the lust giant is, is awakened at the at it happened moment and uh, the, the thing becomes a giant problem. So here's, here's something I want you to just tune in on. This, this uh, lust in David um, was not something that was a one-off. I already said that. He, I could argue, had habitually harbored and nourished lust in his heart for a long, long time. So he was really susceptible in that moment with Bathsheba. And so let me, let me show you this. In 2 Samuel 5, verses 10 to 13, we read, And David became greater and greater for the Lord the God of hosts was with him, and Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David in cedar trees, also carpenters and masons who built David a house. And David knew that the Lord had established him over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of the people Israel. And then we read in verse 13, and David took more concubines and wives from Jerusalem, and he came from Hebron, and more sons and daughters were born to David. So we're told that God had blessed David and had established his kingdom. No argument there. We're also told that David recognized that God had given this kingdom to him and was protecting him and was with him. Then we read in verse 13 something pretty distressing. And David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem. So, okay, so what's wrong with this? What, what's the big deal, you say? David was a king. He was a leader. He had appetites, you know. We can make excuses for that, right? We do today. The bigger the leader, the more people are willing to look the other way. David was undefeated in battle. He had expanded his kingdom. He had a great army. He had put all the people, all the men in the right places. He had organized the kingdom. He had grown it militarily and financially and spiritually. But, you know, so people are like, this is all good. Surely we can not be bothered about this. Why should we care? Well, God cares, God cares, and God did care, and he continues to care. What David actually did here over a long period of time was in direct contradiction with the word of God in Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 to 17. Let me read that for you. When you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I will set a king over me, 
like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother, only he must not acquire many horses for himself or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses, since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return that way again. And, here it is, he shall not acquire many wives for himself, lest his heart turn away, nor shall he acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. Well, there it is. There it is. So what's the king forbidden to do? Not supposed to accumulate horses, not supposed to accumulate wives, not supposed to accumulate gold and silver. David got two out of three right. He got two out of three right. And so he had done well dispensing the horses in battle, Second Samuel 8. He had also dedicated the gold and silver as spoil in battle to the Lord. That's Second Samuel 8 again. But, but, but he had disregarded what God had commanded about accumulating wives. So the question here is, why did God let this happen? You know, you could just say, well, okay, that doesn't make any sense to me. God let it happen and still blessed him. Well, what you have to see here is the big picture. You have to see the big God working in all of history and all of eternity and unfolding his grace plan exactly as he will. Um, nothing can frustrate God's higher plans, and he will work through everything to make that happen. And so um, this is... This is um, a picture of his grace as well as a picture of his commitment to his covenantal promises, his overarching redemption plan. So God graciously worked through David's obedience as well as through his disobedience to keep history right on track with his plan. And so just know, just hear, God's standards never change. So what's written in Genesis about marriage, I was at a wedding last night and I heard the young couple give their vows and it's just an awesome covenant that's made before the God of heaven, and you either believe that or you don't, right? And it's forever, it's, it's two become one flesh, one woman, one man, two become one flesh, and it's for life. Anything outside of that is not marriage. And so the idea there is also it's, it's in the sickness and in health, for better or for worse, till death do you part. So David, David was not there with this. He had a giant in his heart, and it was his lust, and it appears that he just had accumulated this, this passion that had been growing in him for a long, long time. The other thing to note here is that uh, when, when, you're, when you're just feeding these desires over a long period of time, nothing will satisfy it. There's always more to be had. There's always more to be had, and, and sin, habitual sin, has a way of having an addictive reality in your life. And, there's all kinds of studies about what happens to your brain and everything else. And the reality is, when it's not done God's way, you're going to want more and you're going to want worse. And so here David, at the, at the end of the day, he was just totally, totally at a place where he just, he just didn't heed the warnings and couldn't say no. She was very beautiful, very beautiful, means very beautiful. I mean, I, you can only imagine what an amazing creature that Bathsheba was. And so 1 John 2.16 explains this kind of chemical reaction of triggered lust for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride and possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And then you can look at uh, God counseling Cain in Genesis 4.7, where he's basically saying, it, what's in your heart is what matters to me. Not your actions, it's what's in your heart. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, what? Sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So here's warning number two, and it's rooted in David's nourished lust. Examine your heart honestly and often. Consider any areas of disobedience in your life, and that's any, any. It doesn't have to be lust. There's other things that we covet and, and let grow and build and we feed and water. Consider any areas where disobedience in your life and doctrine is holding you back or, or causing a secret life or causing separation lest you become overcome by lust or some other sleeping giant that's hiding in your heart. 2 Corinthians 13.5, 
commands believers, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. We want to be honest with God. We want to test our faith. We want to ensure our salvation is real. Well, let's turn now to David's decision making, David's decisions. So with lust awakened, what happens next? Look at verses three and four. And David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, and now she had been purifying herself from uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. So as David, choice to say yes to his lust, just set in motion some really bad compounding decision making. It's bad decision, begets another bad decision, begets another bad decision, begets another bad decision. It's a snowballing effect. David at this point could easily have just stepped back and said, oh, shouldn't have seen that. Oh, shouldn't have seen that. Let me talk to somebody. Let me get some accountability. Let me go back inside. Let me find out what's happening in the front. Let me, you know, hear from a messenger. There's a lot of things he could have done, right? A lot of things. Instead, he stepped towards the lust and he sent and inquired about the woman. And what comes back to him is an answer that can just seem sort of matter of fact and just some detail in the story, but actually what comes back is the idea that the staff was successful and they come back and they let him know who she is. This woman has an identity. It's not just some random person. We need to look at this because David's response to what comes back to him as the leader from his staff is chilling. It's, it's chilling. It's like, wow. We see now that the object of David's lust, Bathsheba, is a person. She's a precious creation of God. She's made in his image. She has a name, Bathsheba. She's someone's daughter. She is someone's wife. And David heard all this. He, he heard it. So it's just, it's just there for us. It's so awkward. Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And so... I was thinking about this, about how hard it is to challenge power when you're a subordinate, when your boss goes off the rails, how hard it is to speak the truth and love to somebody, and the larger the leader, the more resistant people are to just face the choice to be courageous and speak truth to power. You can think of lots of examples of that. Somebody's job might be at risk, you know, their respect, we respect our leaders so much and we don't want that respect to be undercut, and so we'll just look the other way. We don't, want to, we don't want to know. We don't want to think that they're not what we built them up to be. And so the reality is all this is people are put in really awkward positions and it's unhealthy, it's unsetting, it's damaging. It's just all part of the fallout of someone going down a horrible path. So people generally choose passivity in these moments or denial. But here, here, in, this, here in this text, we have a messenger who came back and he said, is not this Bathsheba the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah, the Hittite? I just would have loved to be in the room and seen the body language there. Um, the voice inflection, he's probably just going, boss, please, do you hear this? This question that comes from this servant of David, inner circle, apparently, a staff member, it should have just been like, you know, when you pull up to the, when the trains come and you pull up to the intersection, there's like big red flashing lights and, you know, sound of horns and bells and the big gates come down. It's like, don't go through here. Don't go through here. And uh, David did. He just blew right past it. He just, it's incredible. And so think about this. The betrayal is so big, but... but Bathsheba's father, Iliam, also known as Amiel, um, from 1 Chronicles 3.5, was someone David knew really well, and he was ranked among the 37 mighty men of David. Very exclusive group, 37 of them. They were, they were just kind of the Navy SEALs. They were the best of the best. They were the ones that helped him be successful on the battlefield and in his leadership. And so, so you know, Bathsheba's father was one of these men. But worse, Uriah the Hittite is another noble guy. He's Bathsheba's husband, 
And another man that David knew, he also was one of the 37. So you got two men that David loved and depended on and respected and appreciated, and he's about to just betray them. You look at Uriah the Hittite, and you just he's such a noble guy. And yeah, he's a Hittite by nationality, but he had been a second-generation Jew by, by religion because his name had the I-A-H suffix on it. So he, he was a follower of Jehovah. His character later is proved out in how he responds when David tries to bring him back and make the pregnancy look like, you know, it was husband and wife sleeping together. The deception there is just breathtaking. But Uriah, it's like super noble, amazing. And so one of the mighty men. So the, the, even, <clears throat> even Joab, who was sent to the front, is not in this list of 37. So here we go. David's about to do a massive betrayal on top of adultery. So, you know, he, he's, he's just blowing right through the warning lights and sounds and barriers. And instead of being caught short, he's blasting past all the layers of accountability. So he makes a really second terrible choice and sends for Bathsheba. That should have been the, okay, we're done. Can't, can't you know, that, that was his next chance. So he just continues down the path. He's feeding his lust and, and he sends for her. So David sent messages and took her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she had been purifying herself from un, her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house. And so here we have it. It's done. The, commult, the adultery happens. So the... Uh, the added detail in the inspired text here about why Bathsheba was bathing is important. So she's actually following Levitical laws that are there for you know a woman's cycle. And um, one writer said it this way: First, Bathsheba was uh, ironically law keeping before David had led her into law breaking. The other thing that's really important here is the timing of her law keeping proves that she was able to be impregnated with the adultery. And uh, that's exactly what happened. So the Holy Spirit is laying this whole thing out for us. Here it is. Nothing good can come from temporally, can, good from, can come from this adultery. So we have to go. Only God himself, and as we know from all of Scripture, did use this disastrous moment eventually for good. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But here we have just, it's, it's done. And so, you know, Bathsheba returned to her house. The text doesn't give us any details about what they said to each other, um, you know, what, what they were thinking, but the sense is shame. The sense is it happened, it's done, it's not good, and, uh, you know, they want to minimize it now and keep things a secret. Then she returned to her house. It means she didn't stay there with David. There was a moment of consummated lust, and then what? Separation. Separation, it's really interesting. This stands in stark contrast to how it's supposed to work with a man and a woman blessed and married in holy matrimony. And so what happens is separation instead of union, instead of coming together, instead of spiritually, emotionally, physically, in all ways to become one flesh, which is the picture of marriage, there's separation, which is how it is when sex happens outside the marriage Covenant. It's it's an ex, something that God intended for beauty and goodness and wonderful blessing. And when we use it in perverted ways, it's a disaster. So I, I just, as I read and reread these things, it just made me think about an avalanche just coming down a mountain in Alaska. So when the little snowpack gives way, then suddenly everything starts to build and there's momentum and down it comes and it's just noise and sound and energy and motion. What ends up at the bottom is devastation. This is a very picture of catastrophe, calamity. And that's what happened here. We, we, get, we literally get an avalanche of consequences. In James chapter 1, verses 14 to 15, this idea is expressed, this, this growing reality that eventually results in death, it says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives forth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So here's, uh, here's warning number three that's rooted in David's really bad decision-making. Sin always snowballs. 
toward devastation unless you seek God's power to break the chain of bad decision making. This likely means running, running for help, running to the church, to accountability, to someone for help, and uncovering what right now may be covered. Your sin will find you out. God is going to uncover sin. All right, well, let's turn now to David's dilemma. Look at the last verse, verse 5, and then we'll see the warning that emerges there. Verse 5, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. It's like it happened. It just kind of hits you like, wow, slap in the face. It's abrupt and comprehensive in its implications. Again, these are the only recorded words of Bathsheba. And they're just laden with coming consequences. David is in big trouble. Bathsheba is in big trouble. Their actions have resulted in an outcome that puts them on the horns of a dilemma. They can't admit the adultery because that means, you know, by the political laws, they should be sentenced to death. And they can't undo the pregnancy. So they knew that. Leviticus 20.10 and Deuteronomy 22.22 Adultery for the person in Israel was death. So what follows then in the remainder of chapter 11 of 2 Samuel into the first part of chapter 12 is just the snowball continuing. It's the painful details of David trying to deal with this dilemma. And it's harrowing. It's chilling. It's awful. What's going through his head where he's just trying to save something out of this terrible reality of a pregnancy I want to focus just for a minute on the pregnancy because we know, that, we know that God is the author of life and therefore conception in a woman's womb belongs exclusively to him. As Christians and believers in this, this word, his word, we know that life begins by God's decree. He makes a life happen out of conception. And so God did this. He's omnipresent, which means he, his spirit, is everywhere in all of his creation all the time. He's omnipotent. He's omniscient. He knows all things. He can do whatever he wants. And so he began this life in Bathsheba's womb that day. He ordained that the seed of David and Bathsheba's egg should come together and that a life would take place. It would be a very short life, we know, but it's a vitally important one that God used mightily in all of David's yet-to-come deception. So It's a sad story, but you have to think in terms of eternity. You have to think in terms of God's higher purposes all the time, things that we can't see. I think last week Jeff preached on, you know, the something out of John Piper was all the all the things that we don't see when God is moving providentially. And so he's moving providentially here. And this life would be short, but it would be used. And he did it because of his grace. He did it because he brought glory to himself and critical instruction to all of us, which is what we're doing this morning, is opening it up and being instructed. So it should go without saying, as Christians, that ending the life of the child in the womb, not an option. Wasn't an option to them. It's not an option today. We've had a big week on that, obviously. And um, I just want to say, it's mind-blowing to think that, that people think it's morally acceptable, even the righteous path to undo a pregnancy. It's just not right. So it's a hard topic, but... We have to look to the big God that creates life, all of life and sustains all of life and hold the right position on abortion. All right, so looking just a bit into the rest of the story, we know that the pregnancy becomes key to David committing murder. We also know that the baby dies. So now there's really two deaths. There's Uriah and the baby. They're all a part of this, you know, and David would eventually even lose his kingdom to another flesh and blood son as a part of the far-reaching fallout. So this is, just gonna, this is just gonna go in expanding circles for a while. So here's warning number four, rooted in David's dilemma. Warning number four, remember God's attributes always, his far higher ways, and let such knowledge inform your thinking and the dilemmas of life. Run to God, run to God. Run to God and run to your church family. Repent early and often lest you forget that God knows everything. So I I wanna, you know, as we're we're coming towards the end, stress a a couple things. Um, You know, notice how the consequences of David's sin, we can see God working in his higher purposes, his good and holy work 
within the wreckage of David's sin choices to ever advance his perfect overarching grace plans. It's just extraordinary how God does this, how he advances his salvation plan in and through this story. So I just want to read from Isaiah 55.9 about the idea that God is working purposefully and for good all the time in ways we can't even fathom. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so you can, you can read in Genesis 50.20 about Joseph, the story of Joseph where, you know, what God meant, uh, what, what uh, his brothers meant for evil, God meant for good, Genesis 50, 20. So we have, in this story of David, here's the punchline here, we have a picture of God triumphing far more than we have a picture of David falling. God is always the hero. He's on his throne, he's working his purposes out, his salvation plan is sure, and if you're called according to his purposes, He's going to save you. He's going to use you. He's going to indwell you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to sanctify you, and then you'll go to glory with him and worship him forever and all of, all of eternity. That's the gospel. His higher ways are amazing in this story. And so the other thing that happens here is after all the wreckage, after all the fallout, there's more. There's so much to read in this story. But another son comes into the world through David and Bathsheba, and that son is, is who? That son is Solomon. And Solomon, of course, is not perfect. He's a mess just like his dad in this particular area, as a matter of fact. But he's also a type of Christ, and it's pointing to Jesus Christ, and it's, it's the, promised, the promised Davidic covenant where God, through David, will bring the Messiah. It's, it's just amazing. God is an ever-dependable and good promise keeper, and he is always going to work his grace plans together for good. So, you know, your, your giant might not be lust, uh, might be something else, might be just a hunger for power or something, but let me just read James 1, 13 to 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. This is on us. This is what we have to battle in our own hearts. Even as we have the Holy Spirit, we still have our sin nature, which is going to try to pull us the wrong direction. We live in a world with the sin, the flesh, and the devil, and they're enemies of God and they're enemies of us. Each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So, all right. So in light of all this, I want to get practical. I want to say some hard things because I think it's important that we talk about this in the church. Um, It's just the reality of what you can do with one of these in our culture today, and it's been going on for a while. Um, I moved back from Europe, uh, our last assignment in 2002, and when I got back, we'd been away out of country for a while, and they put me in a hotel room, and the first thing that came up when they turned the TV on was, you know, the pornography channel. I just went, what is this? This is like, you can, it's in the hotel? And yeah, I was in the hotel, and so a lot had happened in the time we were overseas, and I, hadn't, I just hadn't experienced it, and there it was, right in my face. And so what we have with technology today is you're just a couple of swipes and a click or two away from calamity, from starting the avalanche, the mudslide that's going to wreck your life and wreck those around you, wreck your ministry, wreck your job. It's, you're just so close. And uh, I think we need to talk about this. I think we need to talk about this. So... I, I looked up some statistics from a Christian um, polling series. It's called Conquer Series. It's a ministry dedicated to helping Christians run from pornography. And they have 15 claims. And I, I may not get through all of them. It's just hard to, it's hard to hear this. But let me just start. Over 40 million Americans are regular visitors to porn sites. The average visit lasts six minutes and 29 seconds. There are 42 million porn sites, which totals about 370 million pages of porn. That's just mind-blowing of all the effort that's, that's gone on to even create this. The porn industry's annual revenue is more than the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball combined. 47% of families, so half of the families in the country, are reporting that pornography is a problem in their home 
That's probably underreported because people don't tend to be honest in polls. Pornography increases marital infidelity by a rate of 300%. Kids are being exposed to this preteen in the single digits, seven, eight, nine years old. Basically, 100% of kids will see porn by the age of 14 if, if they're exposed. I mean, it's just, it's incredible how aggressive this is in our culture. And 56% of American divorces involve one party being obsessed with pornography. 70% of Christian youth pastors report they have at least one teen that's really struggling with this. Here's one that's heartbreaking. 68% of church-going men and over 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. That's what the stat says. Um, I'll stop there. You get the point. There's 15 of them. They get worse. The last one basically says under 10% of churches are actually going after this openly and trying to help and, uh, they have, with a program. I don't know if God's calling us to do that. I really don't. But I, I've been around the block. I, I'm, I'm old. I served in the military. I flew jet fighters. I lived in that culture. I've seen a lot. And I am terrified by what this is doing to our country and to our kids. It's a real problem. We've got to be honest about it. And this isn't, you know, we're all in the same boat together. We're all sinners. Every one of us. Every one of us. So we all have it. We all have something we have to do is run to each other. Be the church. God doesn't want us happy. He wants us holy. He wants a holy church. He's calling us to holiness. And maybe what's happening in our culture right now is a call for the church to be holy. Let's do it. Let's do it together. Why not? If we're believers, let's do it. Let's do it. So I've given you some, some good and practical warnings. Stay humble and do your God-given duty. Continually examine yourself. Realize that sin is always going to snowball, so break the chain of bad decisions. Always keep the highest view of God. He knows everything. There's nothing he doesn't know. There's no way to get away from what God sees and knows about you. There's no secret place. There's no darkness. There's no closet. God knows everything. We need to see that and believe that. But let me finish with this. If you find yourself busted and desperate like David did, busted and desperate, the avalanche has happened, the noise is done, the energy is complete, and you're just sitting there looking at what happened? What happened to my life? Can I get my life back from this? If you're there, if you're there, the important thing to know is what David did, Psalm 51 broken and contrite, truly repentant heart. And God's going to honor that. God's going to honor that. I've been in counseling sessions with our staff, Jeff and Judy. Jeff likes to, to bring this one up, and I think it's spot on. Charles Haddon Spurden talked about it. It comes from a guy that, you know, everybody gets something from another guy. This is how, you know, <laughs> preaching works. But there was a guy by the name of John Angel James who said, your repentance must be as notorious as your sin. So if you're out and out busted and everything is just done and you don't even know what to do, start with repentance that has no conditions on God. And if you get that right, you'll get eternity right. God will save you. You might not get your job back. You might not get your marriage back. You might not get your kids back. You might not... I don't know how the consequences of sin... Again, it's the concentric circles and how God adjudicates that and his perfect, just will. I, I don't know, but I do know there's a promise in Scripture that says if we come to him without conditions, we know we need him, we know it's by grace alone we're safe, we're saved, he'll save us. Think about Zacchaeus, Peter, Nicodemus, Lydia, the Philippian jailer. These are all examples of people that went... God, I need you. I'm here without conditions. Save me. And then the church will rally with you. We will, we will rally with you. I promise you we will do that because that's what the church is for. David did it. Psalm 51. Read through that. Read the whole thing. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me.